I'm Belinda Tate. I'm the executive director of the Kalamazoo Institute of Arts. I'd like to thank our panelists as well as each of you for taking the time to join us this evening. For the next hour, we will discuss the challenges that museums have been facing over the past few months and some of our plans for the future. Before we, jo before we jump right in, I'd like to note a few items that will help you participate and get the most out of this conversation. If you would like to submit a question to one or all of the panelists, please submit your question using the Q&A function, which you can access at the bottom of your screen. If time remains after we finish our formal program, I will try to direct some of these questions to our panel. Also, I want you to know that this evening's session is being recorded and will be made available for viewing later. I'd like to introduce our panelists for tonight. For most of you, we are maybe familiar faces, maybe not familiar names, I'm not sure. But I am honored to be joined tonight by two friends and colleagues at art museums here in Michigan. Dr. Salvador Salort Pons. Hello. Hi. Dr. Salvador Salort Pons was appointed director, president, and CEO of the Detroit Institute of Arts on October 2015. He envisions the DIA as the town square of the community where all will be welcomed and represented. Since his appointment, the museum has made diversification of its board, staff, and audiences a critical priority. A native of Madrid, he holds a master's degree in geography and history from the University of Madrid and a master's in business administration from the Cox School of Business at Southern Methodist University and a doctorate in the history of art from the University of Bologna in Italy. Dana Fries Hansen leads the Grand Rapids Art Museum's staff of 50 in fulfilling the museum's vision to serve as a cultural beacon and a civic anchor. He is a member of the Association of Art Museum Directors and currently serves on the board of Experience GR, as well as advisory councils for Art Prize and Cranbrook, among others. Fries Hansen holds a BA in Art History from Carleton College and was awarded the Helena Rubinstein Fellowship at the Whitney Museum of American Art Museum Studies Program. He attended the Museum Leadership Institute at the Getty Center in Los Angeles. And as I mentioned, I am Belinda Tate, Executive Director of the Kalamazoo Institute of Arts, where we embrace the KIA's vision that the arts are for everyone. To give you a sense of the KIA, we offer more than a dozen temporary exhibitions each year. We support a lending fine arts library, as well as the Kirk Newman Art School, which typically serves over 3,300 art students annually. I received my undergraduate degree in art history from Yale University, and I hold a master's degree in liberal studies from Wake Forest University in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. I currently serve on the board of directors of the Association of Art Museum Directors and the American Federation of Arts, and I have served on the American Alliance of Museums Task Force on Diversity, Equity, Access, and Inclusion. So welcome. In just a few minutes, I am going to ask both Dana and Salvador to describe in just two minutes what's been going on at your institution for the past few months. What have your priorities been? In short, what's new? So let's start with Dana. Okay, well, thank you uh, very much. 
Um, it's a strange time, to be honest. Um, it, we closed our doors on March 13th. We made that decision on March 12th. It was, uh, it was fast and furious, um, but I've had the support of a wonderful leadership team to make decisions. A lot of the early weeks were being reactive, figuring out what to do, how to keep people safe, what does this mean? Uh, and over the nearly 100 days since then, um, we've been on a roller coaster ride. But the good news is that uh, we have a wonderful staff, we have a wonderful support from the community. We got calls from um, donors and members saying, here, I'm going to pay my membership dues early, or we'll let um, your grant stretch farther. And so that's really been heartwarming, and it's very, very important. Um, we've been um, trying to reduce the, um, the, the uh, cash outflow so that when we do reopen, um, we will have um, a powerful uh, opportunity to um, burst forth. And um, what we found out is we'll need to phase in. We're learning more and more about the virus and how um, we can prevent it from spreading. And we feel like this is a public health emergency and we needed to treat it like one and play our part. Absolutely. And thank you so much for doing such a wonderful job in Grand Rapids. Our community is so lucky to have you, Dana. The same is true for you, Salvador. You've been doing a wonderful job in Detroit uh, during some very difficult times. What's new uh, at the DIA? What's on your mind? <laughs> well, first off, uh, Belinda, thank you so much for having me uh, in your uh, virtual uh, uh, presentation with Dana. And uh, thank you for bringing the museums of Michigan together in this conversation. I, I really appreciate the opportunity. Um, as Dana said, we have been also being uh, closed uh, since March 13. We've been following the guidance of our governor and also the advice of the medical authorities. And our priority has been to keep our staff safe and healthy as well as our collections. So the museum is closed and we have had very minimal operations. Uh, a group of DIA members, I call them the heroes, have been going every day there. Very few members of our security team, our collections management, engineers, uh, some people in accounting that have been keeping the fort and keeping the collection safe. Now, uh, the museum has been uh, really pivoting from, you know, our uh, community engagement, in-person experiences in the galleries, for which I think the DIA is a nationwide famous into, you know, the online experiences and, uh, you know, upgrading our web page and providing opportunities for learning and for education to uh, the members of our Tri-County, Oakland, Wayne and Macomb you know, to the schools, to the seniors, to our community partners, has been the priority of our curatorial and education teams, our gallery teachers. So everybody's been uh, collaborating uh, very much into keeping the museum in mission, but of course, doing it virtually, doing it um, online. Now we are in the process of finishing up our plans for reopening and I can tell you, everybody is very excited to, to go back into the building. And of course, we are gonna do this with all the necessary protocols. So the workspace is safe. So our galleries are safe for the staff to go back and for the visitors to come back and visit their old friends, the great works that the DIA holds in public trust for all our community. So, this is a little bit the summary of where we are right now, Belinda. Absolutely. Well, I personally can't wait to get back there to see some of my favorites, including uh, the Rivera murals. So let me know as soon as I can come. Similarly, at the KIA, we have been closed since March 14. We've had a few KIA heroes who have been keeping the fort during that time and the remainder of the staff has been at home. We're just starting to return to work 
on some staggered schedules because we are hoping to reopen the museum in the coming weeks. We haven't publicized any dates yet, but in this time, like the two of you mentioned, we've been making the grand pivot from on-site programming to online programming and thinking a lot about service to others and how can we serve our community online. Um, and that has been a process of both grieving and celebration. For example, we grieved the loss of our youth art camps this summer. You know, we typically have hundreds of kids with eyes wide open uh, coming in and so eager to make art with a sea of supplies and we're missing that. Um, however, our team developed an art camp in a box kit and people are buying the kit and now, you know, people can have art camp at home and some of the pictures of kids uh, making art at home are starting to come into the museum. So we are grieving the loss of some programs, but we're also celebrating the success of new programs. And I know the two of you are doing the same with some of your new online programming. So this is the, this talk is uh, entitled Art in the Age of the New uh, Normal. Uh, there's not a whole lot that seems normal um, as of yet, but in addition to the pandemic, we've seen a wonderful outpouring of community love and a quest for justice and an end to systemic racism. And it seems that this is also becoming a part of our new normal, gratefully. So I know each of you have had a longstanding uh, um, commitment to um, diversity uh, work, and I'll just use the word div diversity uh, uh, to stand for DEAI, but can you tell us a little bit about what you've done, what you're doing, um, how are you and your institutions really continuing to try to make progress in our communities regarding diversity, equity, access, and inclusion? And this time I'll start with you, Salvador. Thank you, Belinda. Yeah, this has been a top priority for the organization since I became director in 2015. So we have a specific plans to diversify our board that reflects the demographic makeup of our community. And as you know, we are uh, very uh, um, well supported by the, uh, the residents of Oakland, Wynnum, Macomb County. So our goal is the, that the board of the DI reflects the demographic makeup of those of those uh, counties, and uh, we had specific goals that we are uh, achieving every year to have a, a diverse board. This is really in, in the interest of our organization. We need to really bring the different perspectives and different backgrounds to make the DIA uh, a museum that really serves everybody and that works um, efficiently. We've also been. Uh, very much focus on diversifying our audiences. We want everybody to be welcome at the DA, and, and therefore we have really diversified uh, our programs and exhibitions, uh, reaching to the African-American community, reaching to the Latino community, reaching to the Asian community. And uh, this has been a great experience for the museum because through, through these uh, exhibitions and programs, we have really made new friends and we have been able to add new members of those communities to, to our board and bring those communities into to the museum. We have now weekends in which we devote uh, the weekend to Japan or to, or to India. Uh, and of course, uh, uh, we have Black History Month and we have our famous um, friendless exhibitions that brings the Latino community to, into the building. In, uh, in October. There's still much more that we continue, to, we need to do. We need to reach out, for example, to the Arab American, Arab American community and other communities that uh, are still um, uh, 
the, that the DI still needs to, to embrace. In terms of the staff, a priority has been also diversifying, and, and this is the same concept as the um, um, the uh, the board. I mean, the more diverse the staff we have, the more efficient and effective the organization will be. So it's really in the interest of, of the museum. We have um, implemented uh, paid internships because we want to reach to any member of the community with any background so they know that regardless their background, uh, they have an opportunity to work at the DI and they can be paid for it. So that has been uh, very, very, very successful. And uh, we have also been successful in diversifying our junior team. Unfortunately, we're still working towards diversifying our senior team. This has been the hardest part and this is an area that uh, we must uh, we must improve but diversification is not the only important matter one of the things i learned is that you can have a diversity a diverse a diverse team but the important thing is to create an authentic uh, uh, environment of inclusion in the museum you need to bring those uh, members new members with different backgrounds but they need to be welcomed into the environment. They need to be mentored and helped so they can be successful in an environment like museums that have not been a normal environment uh, for them. We were very um, lucky to receive uh, a grant from uh, IMLS that is going to push our work uh, in terms of idea that we were mentioning uh, at the beginning, uh, Belinda, we are in the process of hiring a consultant that is going to help us develop our, our plans. We have already started uh, providing diversity training to our staff, to our board, and many of our volunteers. But it's still, there is a lot to be done, and the museum is fully committed to this work. Thank you so much, Salvador, for your work. You and I have been talking about some of these initiatives for years and it's nice to see how much progress you've actually made um, at the DIA. Similarly, Dana, I know that in Grand Rapids, you have facilitated um, many alliances with community organizations um, to work toward a more inclusive environment at the museum. Talk a little bit about some of your efforts at the Grand Rapids Art Museum. Well, thank you, Belinda. One of my uh, one of my most important words is collaboration and co-creation. And so I'm really proud of the legacy that I inherited when I came here and we've continued um, to build partnerships, to listen. That's so important um, to have common goals. And so we, at the, we still, as we look at the history of museums, the history of our institution, um, of our city, um, we need to fight uh, the um, system, systemic racism. And we know that art alone and art museums can't fight um, the system and the depth of the ways that museums have long privileged white Western narratives while leaving other histories untold. We have an obligation to do better and we've been taking some steps towards that. Um, we're listening, we're learning, um, and then we're diversifying the things that we do, the programs that exist, our permanent collection, exhibitions, and future programming. So, for example, in the past three years, we're really proud to say that 80% of artworks purchased by the museum have been by women and artists of color. Uh, the um, same work applies to exhibitions. And so, for example, coming up, um, we've got several wonderful exhibitions that um, focus on the work of black, indigenous, and people of color. Uh, this fall, we're doing an exhibition of some um, local artists. It's called An Interwoven Legacy, the Black Ash Basket Basketry of Kelly Church and Cherish Parish. This is a, um, a mother and daughter artist team. They come from an unbroken line of basket weavers, a traditional Anishabe art form that's been practiced for centuries. Um, it comes from the land. And so to hear these artists talk about their relationship to to our region and to the wilderness um, that their um, ancestors have um, worked in and lived in. Um, it's truly inspiring. And 
Um, then we have an exhibition coming up in um, the fall of 2021. Um, and I know people who are, have, are fans of um, the uh, KIA know the work of Dawood Bay. Um, so this is an exhibition that, that pairs Dawood Bay with Carrie Mae Weems, two uh, African-American photographers um, in dialogue. It brings together a focused selection of work from a period of over 40 years by two of the most important and influential photo based artists. Um, both were born in 1953. They came of age during the dramatic change in the American social landscape. And they met at the Studio Museum of Har in Harlem in 1977 and have been intellectual colleagues and companions. And so our chief curator, Ron Platt, conceived this exhibition. I think he's done a wonderful job. He's worked with both of those artists before. Um, and so over the five decades, they've explored and addressed such themes as race, class, representation, and systems of power. We too also sort of, we've got to look at the future of our field. So uh, we have pa paid internships for people of color, um, which was supposed to happen this summer. And so we had to cancel our summer camp and we canceled our, or postponed our um, internships. But we're excited about that. We also have a special committee uh, of younger adults from our community. We call them the visionaires and they have an executive committee that's um, very diverse and they um, help us with our programming um, to bring in artists, talks, late night events, networking opportunities to broaden the base. And then we focus on the staff. So uh, we have um, some uh, planning ahead for to continued training, but we've already done cultural agility training for docents and staff, training with the Grand Rapids Pride Center, training with um, DisArt, an organization that focuses on people who are differently abled. And so it's, it really is a learning process. Absolutely. Step by step. Step by step. So thank you both for these efforts. We're all learning and growing together. We've done a lot, but this is a time when we have to continue to go back to the drawing board and sharpen our pencils so that we can continue to do more and to do more faster for the communities that we serve because we can see that there is a great need and a great desire for this type of learning among all people. Um, in our community. So this is very exciting. We've been working on some of the same initiatives um, at the KIA um, for the past two years. We've had a postdoc fellowship in collaboration with Kalamazoo College. That's been a very special uh, program for us. Um, last fall, we deinstalled all of our permanent collection galleries and turned over all of our temporary exhibition spaces to mount what we think is the largest display of black art in a mainstream American art museum ever. And we did that uh, by hosting three simultaneous exhibitions, one entitled Black Refractions, selections from the Studio Museum in Harlem, one uh, that included works from our collection entitled Resilience, African-American Artists as Agents of Change, and a third one that was co-curated by the director of our art school and our former postdoc fellow, and it was entitled Where We Stand, Black Artists from Southwest Michigan. And it was a tremendous experience for our community, and we engaged over a dozen artists, I mean, a dozen organizations who really helped us leverage the educational impact of that exhibition um, uh, for Southwest Michigan. Um, we are looking forward to the reinstallation of our permanent collection spaces with an exhibition entitled Unveiling American Genius. And the purpose of this exhibition is to demonstrate that great works of art come from all people of all colors and creeds from every walk of life, from every corner of the country. And so it upends a kind of hierarchy to tell a narrative that is long and windy and takes all kinds of twists and turns. Um, and the show is about 40% women and people of color 
And we've been working on it for years. I mean, we really started about six years ago collecting more art by women and more art by people of color so that we could get to this point um, where we are empowered to tell a more inclusive story. So we're really excited about that, uh, that iteration of our permanent collection when it opens, uh, hopefully, hopefully in August. But thank you both for continuing to be uh, learning partners in this and, and stewards um, over uh, a very important education, educational initiative for our community. So um, we've talked a little bit about um, what's new. Um, what's the new normal? You know, in a few weeks, when we're hopefully starting to reopen to the public, what should people expect when they come to see us? Dana, do you want to go first? Sure. Well, I um, I don't know what normal is. I don't know if it, it'll feel normal, um, and maybe that's a good thing. But the first and foremost is, as, um, as I think all of us have said, we need to uh, take the safety of our community first and foremost. And so when people come to the museum, we will be asking everyone to wear a mask. We'll ask them if they've um, had any symptoms because we want to protect everyone. We're part of actually, the, the, I'm thrilled to be part of not only the Art Museum Directors Association, which both of you are part of, um, but also in Grand Rapids, we have an arts working group. Um, it's a coalition of about 20 different cultural organizations of all different types. But um, we've been talking about um, our relaunch and coordinating so that the cultural audiences are aware of what kind of our ground rules are. Wearing a mask, also staying six feet apart or distancing. Um, and so it's not just that we have to teach people, please don't touch the art, um, but really it's like keep a safe distance from any um, people that you um, that are strangers um, and be respectful and wear your mask. And so that's, that's the first thing that will feel different. The second will be that um, we're starting timed um, ticketing and controlling the amount of people, which, um, you know, one of the things that I love about being a museum director is when we, it's opening night of a big show, the lobby is filled with people dressed up and having fun and enjoying themselves. Well, it's gonna be a while before we're able to have a big party um, and to celebrate in the traditional ways that we've celebrated it. But there's another side of museums, which is um, going to a place and having a, a, an intimate relationship with a work of art. And that will still be possible. In fact, it, it's gonna kind of be required. You can't crowd around with, um, with uh, a group of people. I mean, one of the things we'll also miss is school tours um, because we're suspending that until the schools are ready. Um, and uh, so, that will be, it'll be more small groups of, of people. Um, so there's, those are some of the things. Um, we're excited about our exhibitions. The exhibitions that um, were up on March 13th, we've extended so that people can come back and see them because they had been only open for a couple of weeks. Um, and we're also going to have, um, have more signage about what are the, the new rules and how to wash your hands properly because this is a this is a very serious thing. We've got to protect ourselves. Um, but the opportunity to open up our museums and we anticipate um, also early August. Uh, it, it's a special part of so many people's lives. It is uplifting. It's um, a personal experience. It's a learning experience. So we're glad to be able to do it, but we've got to do it in the proper protocols. Absolutely. Salvador, I assume that you are implementing um, similar changes at the DIA to keep people safe when they come in. How will the experience be different? <laughs> it will be very different. The visitor experience, as Dana was saying, you know, we'll have time entrance, limited number of people into the galleries, everybody will have to wear a mask social distancing, no coats, uh, no, sorry, no bags or coat check available. You know, uh, it's important that uh, we make sure that uh, the uh, gallery space is safe for our visitors. So all the hands-on experiences will be removed. And uh, we will actually uh, 
help visitors move around the different galleries so there are no uh, everybody follows the same direction and there are no so many uh, uh, contacts and, and, and people going against each other as they walk into the different galleries so um, that that's what that's what's going to happen uh, we are you know going to start reopening the museum in a very small way meaning that not so many people will come and then we will be testing and, and growing our numbers as we see it's uh, safe and as our teams also understand you know uh, the dynamic of this new operation one, one of the interesting things is that because we are going to open in this new fashion not everyone in the museum will be able to work and you know dana was saying we're not going to have a school group so what about group preservations or our gallery teachers who normally work with the schools um, will not have uh, we could not uh, could not um, uh, perform their job so what we've done is uh, because this new operation has created new jobs <laughs> we're going to redeploy our team, so some people will be helping with the elevator, some people will help helping with, uh, with signage and with giving directions to, to our visitors, making the experience uh, welcoming, so, so everybody feels in as much as possible that uh, it, is, it is a positive experience. I think the community has a lot uh, of, um, they really miss a lot of the museum and they want to come back and see their former uh, friend, old friends, old friends, you know, and uh, this, I think the staff will really appreciate seeing the visitors come back and getting excited uh, on, uh, you know, re-experiencing the, uh, the, uh, the, the works of art. Uh, right now, we have a, a number of exhibitions that are, will be still open. We actually, before we ended our, uh, before we closed the museum on March 13, um, right after, better said, we, we they installed our exhibition, Detroit Collects, which was a huge success. It was an exhibition of uh, uh, works by African-American artists collected by collectors, African-American collectors in Detroit. And it was a huge success, really made the museum connect with a community and collectors uh, in very uh, deep and significant way. And we have new friends. So that exhibition, unfortunately, came down. The catalog is totally uh, sold out, unfortunately. But we have a, a number of shows, smaller shows in, in, the, in the galleries with uh, a guest of honor uh, painting self-portrait by Frida Kahlo. We have our work, uh, The Wedding Dance, um, presented from a conservation standpoint. And in November, we'll be opening an exhibition on car design. This is an exhibition that is going to be installed in part of our contemporary galleries and tells the story of how Detroit put the world on wheels. And we'll have amazing cars that are masterpieces of design installing the galleries as if they were three-dimensional objects. So, you know, how we present the art now, understanding that the visitors will not be engaging or touching things as we normally have them do in the museum as a way to learn from different, different aspects of the show. Our teams are reviewing with very creative minds how we can have educational tools deployed in the museum for these new exhibitions. Excellent. Um, I know the two of you when, will agree with me when I say art is healing. And I really feel that our communities need us right now. They need us to be a part of the healing process and uh, they need us to play a role in creating unity and a sense of community among the audiences that we serve. And I think reopening is an act of faith. I mean, running a museum is an act of faith, right? We talk about exhibitions that we're going to do three years from now. We, we don't have the funding to do them. We don't really know what's going to happen, but we just write it down and we move in that direction and we just have faith that it will, it will happen. 
Um, so as we look at reopening, we're simply reopening um, because it is our passion to serve the community uh, in this way. It's like we have to do it. Um, and we know and trust that the community is ready and willing and, and able to re-engage with us. And not everyone is at that point right now, and we understand that. And that's probably a good thing. But for those who have literally been suffering because they have not had access to the museum and their old friends, as you mentioned, um, we, are, we, are, we are reopening. Um, we'll have some new protocols similar to the two of you. We'll ask people to wear a mask throughout the experience. Uh, we have a new cleaning regimen and we're not gonna close for the cleaning. People will see us cleaning the spaces so they'll know that it's happening and that it's happening properly and on schedule. Um, and that's really important to us. And we're hoping um, with social distancing, we will be able to provide these deep, rich, intimate experiences with art. I mean, you know, you have to have a bit of a determination to come outside these days. And so we know once you arrive, you really want to have um, a positive experience and you want to feel uplifted and, and you want to feel a sense of joy. And so that's what we are looking to provide uh, when we reopen and we have our audience members uh, return to visit us. One of the things that still remains a question in my mind is how do we marry all of the online success that we've had over the past couple of months with our on-site experiences? And I know you two have experienced the same thing. I mean, our you know, social media likes and engagements have increased by like 6,000%. And we're actually reaching a different audience <laughs> than uh, the audience we normally reach. So we're excited about that. We want all of those folks to come into the museum, but it feels like we are managing, at least for me, it feels like we are managing an on-site experience uh, to cater, cater to the needs of the audience we had when we closed in March, but now there's a whole new audience that has emerged. And for us, they're younger, they're more diverse, um, they're more spread out geographically, and we want to keep them engaged forever. So we're thinking about what kinds of experiences do we provide online to make them feel more a part of what's going on on site? And then what kind of on site experiences do we provide so that people can have an additional resource when they return home, if they want to um, investigate a topic further, or if they want to share their on-site experience with a friend virtually, how can we empower them to do so? So are you two thinking about these same questions? And if so, what are you thinking? I'll start with you, Data. Well, uh, great minds think alike. Um, we've been doing much of that, thank you. Um, and yours sound wonderful, and we've been also working on that. I mean, first of all, we made a decision to have free digital content and virtual programming. Um, and that was uh, an important decision um, because we wanted to have um, access uh, to people from all different um, backgrounds. Of course, there is a digital divide, and we're realizing that. Um, we wanted to be able to also make our materials available to parents who are, um, uh, working with their children at home um, when school is closed. Also to teachers, we've done outreach for teachers. Um, we offered artists interviews and talks, um, art making activities to do at home, resources for, um, for educators uh, when they get back in school. The other thing that was interesting, we experimented was a few live things like this, um, where people could join in Zoom 
um, we did some in the um, at noontime and some in the afternoon. And um, I think some of the people that are watching this have um, been participating in previous um, Graham events. Uh, so that's another important. We've also been asking the audience um, all along as in this unprecedented era, what have you um, what have you enjoyed? How can Graham serve you better? What digital content makes sense for you? Would you like to see? Because I believe, and um, as you said, when we get back into the building, um, it'll be very important to think about the visitor experience as before, during, and after. And so there are ways which we can um, we can do so. Uh, be before people come to the museum, we want to give them a little bit of sense of, of warning and expectations. Our, our code of conduct. It, um, we had things in the in the past about please why we ask you not to touch the art. Now we're going to say why we ask why we ask you to wear a mask, etc. Um, and give them sort of manage people's expectations. Um, and so and then also continue to to develop content so that the exhibitions that may be hanging on the wall, we can also send them a link to an artist interview. Um, last uh, two years ago, we did an exhibition with Alexis Rockman um, that's traveling around the, the, um, the country. And in fact, um, in July, it will open at the Flint um, Institute of the Arts. And um, Alexis uh, was willing to create a um, short video of a studio tour um, where he's um, exiled from New York and Connecticut, where he's making new watercolors. So we were able to share that. So it's keeping connected with people in different ways. Um, now people have have sort of developed the skills of watching Zoom and um, dropping in into to events like that. So um, we're really excited about that. Fantastic. So those are you. some of the things that we're doing. Absolutely. Um, Salvador, I know you're thinking about the same thing at the TIA. What are you planning? Well, I think it's uh, all of the above. I mean, uh, the interesting thing for the museum has been our, uh, that we had an internal challenge about this. I, I was mentioning at the beginning of our conversation that the museum has this, you know, nation uh, famous um, in-person experience, how we've been really connecting with our communities and engaging with them and how we want them to come into the building and have these um, experiences that are personal with the works of art, not only individually, but uh, with uh, the friends and families that each person brings to the museum. And over, over really the last 20 years, the museum has been focused on that uh, in-person experience. And we have not really developed or invested in our website or in creating um, a digital a digital media team. I mean, we have some, but not really developed in a way that um, other museums have had. Um, and the reason why is because our strategic plan really called for, you have to bring thousands of students into the building. You have to bring thousands of seniors into the building. You have to do these community partnerships. So um, we have a service agreement with the counties and we needed to meet our goals. And so we did, and I think we did a very good job. I mean, just um, uh, as, a, as, a, as a footnote, I would say that last, last March 10th, we were able to renew our millage with the counties. And this really uh, is a great vote of confidence. And uh, that means that the BIA has another 10 years of financial stability and we can continue doing uh, our work for the community, for the seniors, for the schools, for our community partners in ways that is relevant to them and really bring great uh, education opportunities. So our plan now, uh, after we have learned so much in the last three months, how important is digital is, can we create a digital department and can this department start producing digital assets for the different initiatives that we have. For example, what do we do for the schools? What do we do for the seniors? What do we do for our community partners? What do we do for our exhibitions and programs? Can all these initiatives have a digital component that serves as an appetizer for the public or our audiences as they are home to incite them, to encourage them to come to the museum? So we don't wanna give up everything, <laughs> give out everything in digital, but we wanna have something that really fix the attention of, of, 
of everyone. So we are working very hard in creating now that digital department. We started to think how we're going to, 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 to put it together. And I would like to hire uh, a, chief, a chief digital officer that will be reporting to the director, part of our executive team, just to signal how important this work is going to be going to be uh, for us. And also, we need to upgrade and no, not upgrade, we need to redo our website. <laughs> so so this, this is, uh, we have already a task force in the museum that is going to be working on this. And, and this, is, this is an exciting opportunity for the museum because this is areas that we can really expand and um, now in the fall we will be reviewing or redoing our strategy plan and this is, i know this is going to be a, a very important component in the meantime in the short term we're doing specific things that i think are going to be very successful we are creating a digital library for school teachers so our curators and educators and gallery teachers are going to be filming a number of pieces that will be aligned with the things that the teachers are teaching in the schools so aligned with curriculum you know, um, we, we are going to continue working with um, our schools in other ways that are not necessarily digital. We are creating a toolkit for uh, the schools so that we can bring to them and uh, have different um, instructions to learn about art. And if this could be about African American art, it could be about Asian art, and all these uh, school uh, toolkits will be you know, designed to have as well a digital component. And uh, we will continue working with our community partners to create virtual events. We had a great virtual event last weekend with a magician. And uh, that was extremely uh, successful. And, uh, you know, we had people from all over the state uh, joining for the, for, the, uh, um, for the event. I think, and I think we have to continue thinking creatively and innovative about how we can we serve the communities, uh, especially still during this time. One of the things I did, for example, that I really enjoyed personally was every Wednesday, I would read on our Facebook uh, page uh, a children's book. So it would be story time with the director of the DIA. And it was just amazing. It was not amazing just to see how our community reacted to it. It was amazing for me as a director that, you know, I was doing a completely different activity that was helping the community that was on mission, but at the same time was making me feel so good about the museum. So I think um, the museum is going into a new chapter with digital. We're excited about this. This is an area where we can expand. And, uh, you know, um, I'm sure uh, we will be able to, to serve the residents of Oakland and Macomb County at the highest level through, through digital as well. Fantastic. Thank you both. You know, similar initiatives at the KIA, we took a look uh, back at our video library and we have started to um, edit some of that material and add closed captioning so that we can distribute it on our website and via social media and make it more accessible to more people out there, um, to more audience members. And so, um, you know, tr strategic initiative number one this year is investment in technology uh, across the board, training staff across the museum uh, in terms of how to create digital content so that we can have that content emerge from multiple perspectives uh, from within the institution. Uh, so it's, it's exciting and uh, hopefully that will result in some significant changes on our website as well. So I, I won't give away too much there. So, but everyone stay, stay tuned. Um, as we end, as we near the end of our talk tonight, I definitely want to see if we can take a question or two. Um, and there are lots of questions here. Um, have you considered exhibiting art that has been created in response to either COVID-19 or the Black Lives Matter protests? Sure, Dana. 
Well, I can talk a little bit about that or some of the ideas that we've talked about because um, one of the things that that um, has has happened as a result of um, of the Black Lives Matter protests and um, some broken windows that happened of, um, after a peaceful protest is that uh, plywood the plywood coverings for many of the stores downtown have been turned over in a, in a coordinated effort and then also um, sort of pop up uh, activities um, that have been really quite stunning, heartfelt. Um, artists of a wide range of, of levels, um, different backgrounds, um, and so we're we're looking at ways of which and the, there's a community conversation about how to keep celebrate that um, burst of energy, the burst of passion of, of conversations and um, dialogue, um, and uh, as street art, um, and so that's one aspect. We're we're doing some photography of that. Um, as far as art about the epidemic. Um, that may take longer. Or I haven't. Ha I don't know that much. We've got to do some research. I think. I know there's been a lot of uh, video work and things like that. So, um, but I think that this will affect artists um, for a long time to come. Absolutely. What about you, Salvador? I know that um, the Detroit area has been um, impacted substantially uh, regarding both. COVID-19 and the Black Lives Matter movement. So talk about some of the things that you might be planning there. So we, we already acquired some works <laughs> that uh, these are not very expensive works, but there were some uh, face masks uh, designed by Ai Weiwei that are very interesting. And, and uh, we, I think we acquired them, we acquired them uh, on eBay or something. It was like a really exciting opportunity uh, we have some patrons offering uh, works of art uh, related to COVID-19. So we will be, we'll have to see how we display this in, in, our, in our contemporary galleries. Um, for uh, uh, the um, uh, current event with um, uh, Black Lives Matter, you know, we have, um, uh, I think we are preparing or we want to participate in an online display now of uh, works of art by Detroit artists that are responding to this. And uh, I think our programs team, our community engagement team uh, is in, 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 in contact with uh, uh, the organizers of this um, uh, online exhibition that we would very much like uh, like to like to participate. So, and of course, uh, our museum. You know, in 2017, we uh, we did the great ex exhibition, the Detroit 67, which was uh, amazing. And uh, during the uh, 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 the protests, we had um, images of these works um, posted uh, online through our Facebook page. And uh, we were showing the works as well as a photograph of the artist who did it. And it was just really uh, amazing uh, and very well done. So yes, we, and we wanna do this as well in, into the galleries. Uh, right now, as we reopen, we want to just open um, kind of uh, in, with the basics. And once we feel comfortable, we can start improving things. We will add things to our display. Thank you. Um, similarly, at the KIA, we are looking at what resources we currently have that we can make relevant uh, within the context of the current dialogue. And last fall, we produced a video documentary for the exhibition, Where We Stand. And um, the filmmaker visited the studios of African American artists from Southwest Michigan. They told stories about their lives and their paths as an, as artists in the community. And a lot of that had happened in a way that was not integrated within the mainstream community. And one of the artists who participated said that her invitation to show her work at the KIA was the first time she had ever been invited to exhibit within an inclusive space. The other spaces that she had been uh, exhibiting in were spaces 
um, dedicated to showing the works of African American artists or artists of color in general. So we are now in the process of making this video available to the public. It's going through the process of being closed captioned so that we can ultimately put it online and allow this uh, very powerful group of authentic voices from our own community to come to the forefront to speak about things that are happening in our community. The other thing we're doing is we're taking a second look at a show we mounted last fall, Resilience, African-American Artists as Agents of Change. We're looking at launching that as an online uh, exhibition and educational tool and resource. Um, and we're looking at the possibility of even traveling that exhibition so that um, others around the country might have the, the opportunity to um, experience it and, and learn from it. Um, a lot of artists we know are documenting their COVID-19 pandemic experiences. Uh, there's a wide range of things that are happening out there. So I look forward to maybe just getting a little bit of distance on this mm -hmm. period and you know, then taking a closer look at this work to just sort of see what emerges as the most relevant parts of what we have experienced. However, when we reopen, we will mount a show called Nature Inside and Out, and it will really focus on how we are experiencing the outdoors, which has become the safe space for us, um and how we have started to bring nature within our interior spaces as well and we're hoping that this exhibition will just be refreshing and offer everyone you know a breath of fresh air uh, in a sense something that we're all struggling uh with right now um so um that is really uh, the end of our talk. An hour has gone by very quickly. Time flies when you're having fun. I want to thank both of you uh, for participating in this conversation this evening. I want to thank both of you for your hard work in Detroit and Grand Rapids. Um, our jobs are not easy and you have to approach this work with a lot of determination and passion, and you both do that. We have a very special community of cultural institutions within Michigan. I think that makes us all stronger. So I wanna thank you for being a part of that network and really working to lift everyone up in the state right now. It's been a time when we've really had to lean on each other for knowledge, information, uh, encouragement, and support. So thank you so much for your work and your contributions uh, to our state. I wanna thank all of our attendees. We really appreciate you taking the time to learn more about our institutions and how you can engage with us. We look forward to welcoming you through our doors as soon as possible and as safely as possible. So please find us either online or very soon on site. Um, please check our museum websites and social media for a lot of new content and information that's out there. Um, so new resources have been added and also there will be instructions for how to visit the museum and what to expect. And it's really important that you review those materials before you uh, come on site. And I know that, um, you know, the three of us, we are all eagerly awaiting to get back to the new normal, uh, whatever that might be. And I think that that concept, that notion will just continue 
to evolve and change over time. Sometimes it seems to change from morning to, to evening. Um, <laughs> but we will continue to do our best to keep pace because our primary mission and goal is to share the arts with everyone. So everyone out there, keep your heart in the arts. Thank you so much. We look forward to hosting you soon. Have a good evening.